all for uh, for joining us this morning. Um, I think it's it's a very exciting time for us to be speaking about um, appendix cancer, and I think it's also um, you know very nice that we were able to bring together all the institutions. So many thanks to Carolyn, Lauren, um, for putting this program together, and many thanks to all of you. I think you might have heard through both Dr. Levine's talk and Dr. Lambert's talk how. Um, you contribute to all of this research. I think patients donating their tissues, their blood, their time. Um, I think advocating for this disease is very important. You might have seen that some of the studies and clinical trials were funded through generous donations from patients. So I think remember that in this fight, we're together and we're really hoping that we can continue to advance the field. And so many thanks for, for letting me join this symposium today as well. I wanted to share um, some of the work that was done over the last year um, on consensus guidelines for birth canal surface disease and then specifically for that around appendix cancer. Um, you can see that this, this was uh, funded by uh, the Irving Harris Foundation, but they didn't have any conflicts of interest and did not direct the, the guidelines in any way. And then the journals Cancer and the Annals of Surgical Oncology. Uh, some of the authors on this consensus guidelines did have some financial disclosures. Uh, I've put the reference number down for, for looking those up. And uh, if you have any questions about it, I'd be glad to share those with you. But, uh, but most of us um, would say that these are fairly unbiased and based on our professional opinions rather than, than any kind of financial uh, obligations. So today, I just want to talk a little bit about what is the, the consensus guidelines and what was the mission of this project? And what was the methodology? Um, what do we know about appendix cancer and how have we incorporated that into pathways? And what are the implications for you as a patient, for us as uh, physicians taking care of uh, our patients and then for research and then advocacy? So the clear, uh, the mission of our, uh, the guidelines was really to create pathways for the management of peritoneal surface malignancies and specifically to guide clinical decision-making to facilitate collaborations, widespread dissemination, education, and advocacy. If you look at some bodies such as NCCN, American Cancer Society, um, big societies like ASCO, which is the Society of Oncologists, Society of Surgical Oncology, you know, appendix cancer is kind of relegated a little bit to the corner. And it's because, you know, one, it's uh, rare. Number two, we don't understand it very well. And so what has happened is it, it impairs our ability to advocate for this disease, to study this disease. And I think through bastions of, um, uh, of folks that have taken care of appendix cancer, such as Dr. Sugarbaker, Dr. Levine, Dr. Bartlett, Dr. Lambert, I think the field has advanced over the years, but I think it's important for us to be able to speak the same language, to share the same sorts of information, and then perhaps then come together as a platform to be able to improve the, the care of our patients with appendix cancer. And so really the guidelines were set out to, to produce three deliverables. One was to actually publish a document that would serve as at least the standard of care. Now remember that there are guidelines and guidelines doesn't mean that it replaces the doctor-patient relationship. So clearly when you go to visit with your physicians, you know, please make sure that you kind of find the right physicians, folks that do this often, and use their judgment in the decision-making. But these are set out to form guidelines just so that it allows all of us in the country to make sure that we are at least working within some semblance of this pathway so that we can advance the field. Secondly, to create a framework for collaboration. This was a great opportunity for us to interact with big societies such as ASCO, the Society of Surgical Oncology, the Society of Gynecological Oncology, the Society of Pathology, and so really trying to bring leaders in these fields together to think about appendix cancer, to think about cancers um, that spread to the lining of the abdomen called the peritoneum. And then um, to use these published guidelines to advocate for advancements in the field. One of the issues, and I don't know, some of you might have faced this or not, but one of the issues that we face often is insurance companies will many times deny HIPEC procedures or CRS procedures because they are considered experimental or or not well published and, and really it requires a lot of advocacy on our part to help this and the hope was that these guidelines would do some of it. So I'll just briefly talk a little bit about the method methodology of the consensus guidelines, uh, speak about the work that actually went into this and then um, present them to you as well. So clearly the first step of any uh, guideline development was a systematic review, which means we looked at all the literature that was published 
we examined that, we analyzed it, and we imported it into what we call template pathways. So clearly kind of thinking about how do we uh, frame the management of patients with appendix cancer. It then an, underwent an internal review and actually a review with, with physicians that were non-surgeons. So essentially hematology oncologists, gynecological oncologists, pathologists, radiologists, palliative care physicians, gastroenterologists. And so, so a lot of folks had a chance to look at it and, and see if it made sense from their standpoint. We then um, identified section editors, Dr. Lambert, Dr. Levine were both section editors, but folks of great reputation, people who have dedicated their lives to management of appendix cancer, who then had an opportunity to review these guidelines, see if they made sense, what was not, what was not good, what was, what was good, and then essentially revise these template pathways. We then actually met in Chicago and via WebEx at that time, you know, we didn't realize the world was gonna be a virtual world with the COVID-19 being this way. And now everyone uses Zoom for everything. But at that time, it was, it was kind of unique that we, we were able to pull together folks through virtual platforms and, and had a meeting in um, both real time as well as um, in real time, but virtual and in person. And then we revised the pathways further. These were then sent out to independent review committees, committees of about 13 to 14 physicians that specialize in the management of appendix cancer and other such cancers, who then reviewed this without the imp inputs of the editorial committee or those of us that had developed these. Once they gave their suggestions, we then revised these further. And this was done in an in-person meeting in Boston. We then sent these out for review by three major societies, including SSO, ASCO, SGO. And uniquely, this set up the platform for SSO, which is the Society of Surgical Oncology, to create a framework for how they would approve guidelines uh, and things in the future. And then it underwent a three-step review process. So it, it had an independent review with two physicians, a peer review with uh, the journals that got published and peer review at all of these societies. So, so basically, I'm just trying to emphasize that this was a very scientifically rigorous pathway, which involved collaboration and work from many, 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 many physicians with many hours of work um, that it took, and, and, and obviously more than a year for these to be developed and to come into, uh, into play. So this is just sort of the timeline for these pathways to be developed. And the number of work hours, this is in the publication, so I thought it'd be kind of fun to show this graphic, but over 120 um, person hours, I would say close to 1,000 person hours for everyone that involved and invested their time in trying to uh, create these documents together. So as a patient or someone with appendix cancer, how are these guidelines important to you and what do you really need to know about this? So firstly, know that the Society of Surgeons, Medical Oncologists, people that treat this disease, the good news is that we all wanna to work together. So you can see in this list, the, the leaders of um, peritoneal metastases, everyone came together, um, everyone worked closely together. This was something where all the physicians were able to get onto the same page and, and create these pathways in a way that would make sense to all of us. Uh, this is when we got together in Chicago. Uh, this is obviously now an old picture. You can see Dr. Sugarbaker on the side as well. And then this is the group of folks that actually did the peer review, the committee um, work of actually just looking at the guidelines, making sure that everything worked well. Bottom line again is that there were just you know, numerous physicians who selflessly devoted their time to actually uh, review these guidelines. And then fortunately, we had the, uh, the opportunity to work with different societies to, to have them review this as well. So I think on the whole, there were a lot of uh, individuals who generously gave their time to create these pathways. These pathways have since been published in two leading journals, the, the flagship journal of the Society of Surgical Oncology, which is the Annals of Surgical Oncology, and the American Cancer Society uh, journal called Cancer. So what are, what are important takeaways? So the first thing is to remember that um, there, this, these sets of guidelines set down structures for institutions that wanna participate in peritoneal surface disease to take care of patients with appendix cancer. So the first thing is we do believe that every institution that takes care of patients with appendix cancer must have a defined surgical leader. And this is something where we expect pay, you know, the surgeons to have demonstrated experience in cytoreductive surgery, and I'll go over that in a minute, and fellowship experience where they've done CRS and HIPEC, or certainly have worked with centers where people have done this. I think the biggest flaw that happens is that many times surgeons just fresh out of fellowship or fresh out of training are tasked with building a CRS and HIPEC program. 
And note that a learning curve for someone to do a surgery like a big cytoreductive surgery in high for patients with appendix cancer is about at least 80 to 150 cases. So if you don't come with a lot of experience, it takes a long time for, for patients to have the optimal outcome from these surgeries. And it's not just the ability to actually do the surgery, but also make the right decisions, the judgment of which patient should get chemotherapy, which patient should have surgery, should they have surgery or not, should the intestines be resected or not, should they get a bag or not. And I think all these decisions take a lot of experience. And it is important, therefore, that the physicians that, that provide this care are well experienced in this. We also talk a little bit about having the ability of having a second surgeon um, available for both care of the patients, judgments. You know, in fact, very often uh, at the University of Chicago, we, we run cases by each other where we are, you know, uh, we want to make sure that we're making the right decision for our patients, uh, which is, which I think uh, they always benefit from having a second pair of eyes, especially someone who's also interested in the disease. I think it's important that you have a multidisciplinary team. You know, these words are used often in many institutions, but remember at most experienced centers, you have a dedicated pathologist, a radiologist, a gastroenterologist, people who really think about this disease carefully uh, who are involved in the care of patients with appendix cancer. We set forth quality standards. Um, and this is something that you can ask your physicians when you go visit with them. Um, Typically, we, we expect that every center that it provides care for patients with appendix cancer should see at least 12 or more cytoreduction reduction and HIPAC cases per surgeon per year. Um, so this is important. So this is something that we believe that at least there should be certain volume. There should be a recurring experience of patients being taken care of at the center. We also believe that the rate of complete cytoreduction, reduction, which means that the amount of patients that have the cancer removed in their entirety should be at least 60%. I mean, obviously we would like to aspire for much higher numbers, like 90, 95%. But regardless, we, we think that at least 60% of the patients who have the surgery should have a complete cycle reduction. In addition, and these are numbers that every center must track, and this is everything that you can expect as a patient when you visit with centers to ask them these questions. You know, I think Dr. Levine, Dr. Lambert and I, um, you know, we're all, we want to grow more centers. We want more people to be able to provide care for patients with appendix cancer. We want you to have the most expert appendix cancer care in your backyard, in your neighborhood. But in order to have that, we need to make sure that structures, standards, processes, and quality measures are in place such that anyone who says they provide care for patients with appendix cancer is able to deliver the highest quality care that you might get if you came here or went to Utah or went to um, Wake Forest. But clearly, we believe that the ostomy rate should be less than 25%. So we don't want um, you know, patients getting you know, ostomies without careful considerations, discussions. Uh, we want patients to have discussions about quality of life, fertility, sexu sexual function, uh, physical function, depression. And I think these are all important in the care of patients with appendix cancer. And clearly the major complication rate should be less than 40%. I think most major centers will have complication rates half or even less than that. And we also set forth standards for, uh, for surgeons who wanna participate in cytoreductive surgery. We, we recommended that at least uh, 20 cytoreductive surgery cases must be performed in training, including peritonectomies, learning the formal skills of doing these surgeries. These are not surgeries where you just go pluck out tumors or, you know, strip out tumors or peel it out without knowing the formal aspects of the cytoreductive surgery, the technical aspects, the challenges of doing these surgeries well, um, and it's important that this is brought forth. So this is something that I think we're going to send out as handouts for all of you, so please do not try to squint to try to read this very much. Um, but these are the, the pathways that have been created. You heard Dr. Levine speak specifically about appendix cancers and the types of appendix cancers that are out there. The, this is a pathway for patients with low-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasms, lamin, when it spreads to the lining of the abdomen, causes a condition, pseudomyxoma peritonei, which is a syndrome, and the disease is sometimes called either low-grade carcinoma peritonei or DPAM. You'll hear these variable terms. Again, I think because of the variable uses of uh, our terminology. Now, these patients are very different 
than patients who have signet ring cell cancer, poorly differentiated cancers, ex-goblet adenocarcinomas that spread to the lining as well. And so the pathways have been split out based on pathology. So it's very important that when you are reviewing these, you know exactly what pathology you have or your caregiver or your family member um, has when you're advocating for someone with appendix cancer. So clearly it talks about the tumor markers that should be, um, that should be uh, obtained, the kind of imaging that should be obtained. You're gonna hear a little bit about the imaging uh, later today in advanced research on that. You wanna talk about the peritoneal spread the kinds of tumor markers, the, the, the genetics that needs to be, uh, the, uh, need, the genomics actually, excuse me, that need to be obtained on these tumors. And then clearly when patients should have surgery. Now remember there are some choices and these choices are where you sit with your physicians and, and use their judgment and yours to decide what is the best pathway moving forwards. But clearly this outlines what, what should be done for patients with, with low grade neoplasms. For classic adenocarcinomas, I think this is where we kind of talk through, again, the tumor markers, the tumor board, talking about the radiological features that, that are important and when do we think that complete cytoreduction is predicted versus not, what kind of chemotherapies to use, how long to use the chemotherapies for. Should they be used for three months before surgery, three months after surgery, six months before surgery, or six months after surgery? And how do you decide which chemotherapy to give? And so these guidelines kind of outline some of these for physicians to, to help use in their practice when they see patients with these diseases. Similarly, for patients with the goblet cell carcinoids or ex-goblet adenocarcinomas as currently updated in the WHO pathways, this is, this is what the, the clinical pathway that we have outlined over here, depending a lot on the type of pathology. Is it signet ring cell? Is it poorly differentiated called TANG-B or TANG-C? Or is it more a low-grade uh, goblet cell carcinoid like a TANG-A? which has a much, much, much better survival than those that have the TANG-D or TANG-C. So I think it's, it's important to kind of be able to use these pathways. And for you as a patient, it is important to review them. You know, I think one of the things that we tell all our patients that you have to empower yourself and your family members to learn about your disease. Majority of the physicians that you will meet will not have encountered anyone with appendix cancer and may not have expertise in appendix cancer. They may wanna treat you like colon cancer. They may wanna treat you like other diseases, and I think it's important that, that you advocate for yourself. And I think these pathways can help um, patients do that for themselves. I think uh, this laid out a lot of framework for collaboration. I think uh, we have had a lot of success. We've had lots of organizations across the world reach out to us about these guidelines. We're hoping that we will be able to update them either on an annual or every two year basis bring together more physicians. The purpose of these is to be more collaborative, to be more inclusive. And in fact, it would be great to even have patient representatives on these guidelines such that you could look at these and say um, that you know, this makes sense or this doesn't make sense. So I do think that we're looking forward to expanding these further. We're in talks with societies and organizations to, to deliver them through their platforms. And so certainly the three of us and others will keep you updated on, on the latest for these guidelines. We've also reached out to major insurance companies. And in fact, uh, Dr. Staley from Emory University and myself uh, went to Texas to meet Blue Cross Blue Shield um, of essentially the mountain region, which includes Utah. And then of course the Midwest region, which includes Chicago um, to discuss how these guidelines have been brought together by numerous physicians in the field and how patients with appendix cancer must be covered for their surgeries and HIPEX. And usually it just takes one institution or one organization or one insurance company to change their policies and then it's easy to advocate to all other insurance companies to the NCCM guidelines and other such places and so clearly if you can advocate for this disease as well I think it helps and then also with oncological society so how what is the takeaway of the Chicago consensus the first thing is that remember that all of us that do this work in the country most of us know each other uh, most of us like each other and most of us want to want to cure this disease. We want to cure this cancer. We want to do better research. We want to help our patients get through these cancers without having to have major surgeries um, and get them through this in the right way. But make sure that you clarify the experience of your center, and make sure that you uh, um, that you know exactly how many they do, what their outcomes are. Feel free to take the management pathways with you to your appointments and your visits and clarify these. Again, remember these are guidelines. This is not exactly how the physicians may treat you, but it's certainly worthwhile to have a conversation to ed educate yourself. 
uh, expect the quality and standards that have been outlined and clearly advocate for the CC. So I do want to thank our team. Um, Francisco Esquierdo, who's a visiting uh, surgical oncologist who came from Chile. Alex Plana, our medical student, who is now a resident. Todd Sherman, who is now a, a surgeon who specializes in peritoneal disease at the University of Iowa. And Daryl Skaterwater, our fellow, who's now a surgeon in, uh, in Oregon. And Kujita, our program manager, who's been the glue for all of this. But most importantly, I want to thank all of you. I think this is important first steps for us to move the field forwards. I think today's program is exciting. You will hear what is the latest in research uh, from, from great researchers from all the three institutions. Please stay tuned, listen to this, ask questions freely. We're here to answer questions for you. Um, and we look, look forward to seeing those of you that join our breakout session as well this afternoon. So thank you very much for your attention.